Today, today, we're doing another riding of the coattails, trying to build a name off of other people's work, just like the fitness industry, because why not? But hey, we get to add some stuff, we get to learn some things, let's see what I learn, let's see what you learn. Who's here in the chat? I see we got three viewers. Nick Belcher, yes, you are first. Hello. Good to see you on. All right. So, what is today's video? This is called... Yes, that's what it's called. We got Top Finger Exercise for Guitar Mastery by Stitch Method Guitar. So, what, what could possibly be the top finger exercise for guitar mastery? And why? Why is it the top? Hello, Mr. Taylor. Glad you can make it. All right. Now we're just missing Lord Potato in Plastodon. We are waiting for Ninjo. Who, who am I? We used to have Una Boy on here all the time. He hasn't he hasn't been on in a while. Um. All right. So I'm gonna get my headphones on so I can hear what we're watching. I better double check, make sure everything is, uh, Joe Lou! Yes! You are a current regular now. Very good. How can I forget? Lord Potato's out shopping with Mom. Well, perhaps that's why she asked if I wear hats when it's cold. Okay. Uh, let's double check, make sure all the audio is going to the correct channel. I do believe we are good there. All right. Let's make this bigger. And away we go. Let's see what the top finger exercise for guitar mastery is. All right, we've all seen some finger exercise videos, maybe have a book or two on it, and we might still be asking ourselves the questions, what is this doing for me? Is it actually working? Can I track my progress? How do I make it less daunting, less boring? Can it be better, can it be fun? And I'm here to answer those questions for you with a definite yes. Uh, we're gonna study a way of exercising your fingers, but not only your fingers, your mind, and how the guitar works, and we're gonna get it done quite easily, and I know that you can do it. Welcome back to another episode of Stitch Method. Today we're gonna be talking about worthwhile finger exercises. Uh, we're gonna hit it right on the head right now. All right, so the way that I approach finger exercises is that they should involve your mind, they should involve how the guitar works, and of course they should involve your fingers. The whole point of finger exercises is to get your fingers to not become mechanically dependent on you know scale shapes or familiarity. It's to keep everything working individually so that when you call upon these fingers on any context that they can go where they need to go. And so what I like to do is I like to take a riff that I know very, very well. And you can do this with any riff that you know very well. That's the, that's the key. And you take the riff and you play it, which in this case, we're gonna start with uh, Black Dog by Led Zeppelin. I'm just gonna show you the first little part, right? This. All right, we take. I never learned that riff. Do I need to know this riff in order to uh, play along with this exercise here or what he's talking about? I do like a lot of what he's saying already. You know, basically the exercise needs to have purpose. That's what I gather from it. The exercise needs to have purpose. As far as not relying on muscle memory, at least I gather, I think that's what he was saying. Not to rely. You don't want to have to always recall certain things. I think that's almost impossible because we're always going to be relying on... We, we rely on muscle memory so much anyway, so... 
But let's continue. Let's see what he, uh, you know, what he, what he says when he gets more in-depth with this stuff. Apparently I'm having a hard time talking today. It's probably because it's freaking cold. It is cold out there. Good Lord. It's 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So I know it's below zero Celsius. Take that riff, and I know it well, I've played it for 20 years, and what you want to try doing is try playing it in at least one or two other spots. And what this does for you, and you're going to find out, is you have to try and keep it up with the tempo. You have to try and play the riff exactly how you can play it in speed in the regular position. And what you do is you're going to find your start note, okay? Very simple. That's my start note. What note is this? Well, this is an E. Now, if you don't know that, you can hum it out. But this E is in two different places right now. Uh, it's here, or it's here. And how do you... Sorry, I forgot to put it back on this. You do that. Well, it's very simple. If you have a note on the A string, you can, you can figure this stuff out. If you have a note on the A string, five frets back on the D string is the same note. And then five frets up on the E string is the same note. All right, seven minus five is two. Seven plus five is 12. All right, and this works for uh, all the strings except for the B string, we'll get there. So if I had a note or riff that started on the A here, right, you could subtract five and that'd be on your open A, that's the A string. All right, so here's your A. Subtract five, you're on the next string over, and that's five. If I was on, let's say, the D string ninth fret here, just gonna show you, all right, this ninth fret, well, if we subtract five, nine, uh, I'm sorry, nine minus five is four, fourth fret of the G string, all right? If we add five, nine plus five is 14, it's up here on the A string. When you subtract, you go one uh, string uh, thinner, and when you add, you go one string thicker. And if that blew your mind for a second, take your time and figure that out. But that's the way you want to start. That's the easiest way to find the first note. So I have this riff, and I can find that first note here, here, or here. Remember, when you subtract five, you go to the thin string. When you add five, you go to the thick string. And that works for E, A, D, strings. All right, so once you find your first note, believe it or not, the guitar is laid out in such a fashion, at least with the first four strings, that uh, things kind of feel the same. If you watch me this, you know, I'm gonna find that first note, look at my fingers. So this is the part here, once you find your first note, you are gonna have to listen and like really try and think of where are my next set of notes? This puts your ears in the game, all right? You might say, okay, well, do you easily just transpose it? Or do you have to figure it out? And it's both. Sometimes the riff is gonna feel exactly the same, but there's gonna be usually like a hiccup, and we'll talk about that. So, I have my riff. And I'm gonna find my first note here. And if I were to try and figure this note out, or this riff out right here, it plays a lot differently. All right, well, I think I get the gist of the of this exercise. I don't call it a finger exercise. I don't really. I don't know. Could you call it a finger exercise? It's more like, oh, what would you call it? I mean, it's a good idea. It's more like teaching you how to find the same notes in various locations on the fretboard. It's actually something I've thought about doing with one student where, you know, you like you have a riff. And it's like, all right, now figure out three other ways to play the same riff. It's got to be the same notes, got to be just laid out in three different ways. So it definitely makes sense. Um, you know, I'm trying to think like what's a what's a riff that I could do. Hola, Anna. <laughs> um, our lovely video editor has joined the stream. Let's see. I have a feeling this is gonna be a. Uh, I don't know. We might need to watch it, another video on top of this because right now I'm not having much to add to this. It's a great, great idea.
I think it is, you know, taking a riff that you know. Let's, let's just say. tune <clears throat> but yeah it's a great idea you know just to kind of explore things and it's also you know uh talking to guitar students and they're like trying to figure out a song and or maybe they're looking at a tab and they're like how are you supposed to play this and i'll look at the tab and like well why don't you just try it like this i'll basically take some notes that are laid out on one string and move it to another string and that's something I recommend people do when you're having a hard time playing a riff or a lick the way it's tabbed out perhaps try try moving the notes to other strings other frets and perhaps you'll find another way to play it that makes more sense to your hand I've seen some stuff uh, this one tab book I had, it had Cliffs of Dover tabbed out in it, and I think one of the main riffs was tabbed out in such a bizarre way. It's like, why would anybody ever think to play it like this? Hello, Chris G. Uh, have I seen Kiko? I don't even know how to pronounce his last name. I'm just going to go Kiko's Minimal Effort Finger Exercise. I have not. I have not seen that. But perhaps I should look that up. Um, yeah, let's, let's continue watching here. We got about 10 minutes left of Stitch Methods video. Let's see if we get more in depth here. <laughs> This is like one of those cooking shows. I had that riff already figured out, all right? It's like I put it in the oven, took it out of the bottom oven. But you want to sit, and this is how you do it. Once you find your first note, you know there's going to be some sort of like familiar footprint, we'll say. Uh, and it's going to take some time. Your ears, you, you know, you have to look and see if you can nail it down. If you have to go back to your original riff. <laughs> figure it out that is totally cool and it's totally worthwhile and you should do that the only trick is finding your first note and then the riff should uh, fall down underneath your fingertips as you listen and as you try to figure out that stuff so now I know I'm talking fast and I had a cup of coffee but you got a slow down button right about there I think all right so once you have the riff footprint you want to try and play it in a new place at the same time or the same tempo now if you watch here I'm using a different finger combination to play this riff Ooh. and because you're using a different combination of fingers you have a finger exercise now that not only put your mind on the guitar neck but also rearrange your fingers to play it in a different way and upheld yourself to playing it in time. Your finger exercises are okay, but if you're not playing to a tempo, then how do you know if your fingers are gonna be able to do it in real time, whatever your riff is? So you have this. Or you have this. I'm gonna try and take that riff and transpose it up here. And you're gonna see, you know, it's gonna feel 99% the same, but we have a hiccup. And in doing this, solving that hiccup is where your finger exercise, your mind exercise comes into play. And so check this out. I have my first note here. I found my first, my first note on the E string. I added five. You, you and you add, you go up to the, uh, sorry, you go to the thicker string. And this riff feels exactly the same for the first part. But I'm gonna go play the riff as it kind of feels. Oops, that's not it. Then now you have to discover. You don't have to be great theory. You're gonna go, okay, that's the wrong note. Okay, that sounds too high. That might be it. Yeah, that's it. Now all of a sudden, it's gonna feel very awkward. Look at this move. And if it feels awkward, this is a great time to develop a new pattern of finger work to make that riff smoother. And when I was doing this, I said to myself, I gotta get myself ready for that move. I'm gonna use my 
pinky here, so my first finger's in place. That moves instead of me stretching back, and now I use my middle finger here. So you can see how I have to shift my fingers. And now I gotta figure out the rest of the riff. And then so it's... Again, it takes some time in figuring the riff out. I'm trying to save time by showing you, but I know what I'm talking about. But I'm trying to you know, show you that when you take your time, you're gonna develop one or two new pathways to your mind, your fingers, and the guitar neck. And you wanna sit and discover them. And then when you have one or two new places to play, you wanna try and play all of them at the same speed. This is where your finger exercises are worthwhile. You can tell if they're working, because my gosh, they don't feel the same. Oh my gosh, right? But I'm doing it, I'm playing it at, at the same tempo. So you have your instant like success, your instant reward by saying, you know what? I'm moving my fingers in a different way, and it's making music. So I know these, these finger exercises are working. So check this out. Of course, this is a stitch by the video, so we know I'm gonna screw it up. Here we go. <laughs> There's a mistake. I knew it. Let's do it again. The more you do it, the better you'll get, all right? But let's save us some time. I'm not going to edit that one out. And you want to take your favorite riff. If it's a slow riff, if it's a fast riff, if whatever it is, as long as you know it well, you want to try and transpose it. The first step to transposing is just finding that very first note. Once you do that, it should be uh, it should be downhill, like easy, or a little tiny bit uphill just to figure out what comes next. You're going to have fun. That's part of the journey. All right, so I'm going to show you two more riffs like this just so you can see the work, you know, and, and show you that you can do this in different levels. All right, so if we take this very iconic riff. Pretty Woman, you know, the idea for this guy is to show you, okay, I'm gonna try and play it in a different place, but I really only play it, you know, when I try to do this, I found I really play it in one other place that uh, sounds right. And so I took the first note, and so, okay, let's, let's try and get this note on the E string. That's the next note. Alright, then you can down. And so I sat for a couple seconds and just figured out this guy. That's a finger exercise in itself. You can see all these like crazy stretches and kind of maneuvering. And the idea again is to keep it in tempo. And here you can kind of switch back, back and forth between these two positions and try to keep the riff going. And it's like, okay. And I'm telling you, you feel it. You totally feel it. You feel like, you know, this like, okay, I gotta think my way through this. And you're hyper like on it. But once you get it, you're going, man, my fingers are actually moving in ways they haven't moved before. And it's the pure beauty of doing finger exercises that are tied to a riff that you know, try and keep it in tempo. The last example I'm gonna show you is I'm gonna take a song that I kind of already talked about on my channel. It's by one of my favorite bands, Fish. And it's, a, it's an easy kind of riff. It's called Free. And the idea here is that this is a chord based like melody. And it starts with D chord. And, and if you don't know this stuff, it's okay. You can watch. Um, and you know, I'll try and post the video down below if I have it. But the idea is it's all chords. Let me show you the riff. D, C, E minor, D, G, D. And with that knowledge of playing a riff, sorry. It's like, okay, let me try and play that in a different place. And so, if you're not familiar with the cage chord system, the video or playlist will be popping up right here. Trust me, you know, I found a different voicing of my D chord, which is the C shape voicing. And I'm trying to find that melody. Oops, sorry, let me raise the first see it. There it is. That's my D chord. And next comes a C, and so I just pull back two frets. See that? Give me E minor. Try to find your E minor voicing wherever you are. I know it's E minor right here, let's see. There it is. To a D, I know it's a D right here. Right? I know the C-shaped G right here, and we keep with that theme. There it is, through G chord. Right, so now you can use it to transpose your chords, see that the melodies are based from chords, can be moved around. These are great exercises. These fingers, and even this hand here, are going to be doing something different that you're not used to. This will keep you away from being like pattern-based all the time. You have your fingers just do the same thing. You find yourself kind of like playing the same kind of moves in the pentatonic. These types of exercises are going to give you some freedom here. And so, really quick, I just want to talk about the Patreon practice sessions. It's going to be very simple. I mean, almost a board to watch. I'm just going to feel myself trying to uh, learn a uh, fish riff that I've known for 30 years, but I knew it incorrectly. And you're just going to watch me try and do it in two other spaces because uh, in this video, I believe you know the idea. You should know the riff. You should find the first note and try to get the note up to tempo. Try to get the riff up to tempo. Automatically, different fingers will be used. And so, uh, I'll be a little vulnerable in the Patreon practice sessions, and you'll kind of just watch me practice, all right, and screw up probably a lot. So, well, this is a absolutely terrible reaction video because I really don't have much to say. Um, really like the guy's idea. I would say anyone watching this, the live stream now or the archive stream, go watch his video <laughs> with it not being played twice as fast. I think we should go to the next video uh, in my watch later list. And perhaps, yes, I know Kiko is the current Megadeth second fiddle guitar player um i'll definitely uh keep an eye out for kiko's exercise i actually might even have it on the list there so all right we're going to we're going to change some uh some of what the title of the stream is and add another video here because yeah that's a great video. I have nothing to add. <laughs> so, let's see. What else do I have? What's next? I'm going to remove that one. I don't know, do I have the Kiko thing in here? I've got a lot of stuff.
I don't think I do. All right, well, it was brought up in the chat. Let's go check it out. Trying to update a title here. Two, we'll just say two finger exercise ideas. And Updated. Hey guys, the other day I posted a video talking about how I practice. Whoa! We don't want two times fast now. This for endurance before a show. So check it out and let me know what you think. So I was reading the comments and there were a lot of questions about what kind of exercises I do before a show and also what kind of exercises I practice to avoid tension in my plane. So let me show you here one specific exercise I use to avoid tension in my plane and to play softly, fluently, and with minimal effort, all right? So it's a simple exercise, very simple, but it's very powerful. So, and you can get great results with it, okay? But before that, please subscribe to the channel, uh, leave your comments, and please always give me suggestions for my next videos, right? So let me show you this simple and powerful exercise. By the way, you should do it every day, otherwise you don't, you're never gonna see any results, right? There is no miracle. So every day you practice a little bit of this exercise that I'm gonna show you right now. So um, you can practice using any scale, any pentatonic, arpeggios, whatever, it doesn't matter actually. So let's see uh, a B minor arpeggio. <laughs> Technically, that would be a B minor add nine arpeggio because you got your root, you got the fifth. Let me change this. What's in the. Because <clears throat> you got your root note, fifth, your octave, that's the second interval, there's your minor third. Second interval is the same note name as your ninth. So, technically, B minor. Add nine arpeggio. Right? So let's see, you know, this phrase here could be a bit more, I know, maybe more more chords, like uh something like that could be any phrase could be just a G, G major scale right something like that so what you're gonna do just rest your fingers on top of the strings right and don't press don't try to play any note and just play the same thing so something like Thank you. 
or the scale. I know it doesn't sound great, I know, but that's the point. You're teaching your hand and you're teaching uh, your brain and your hand, your fingers, the minimal effort concept, all right? So your fingers will be so relaxed that no note is going to come out. <laughs> Just uh, this ugly noise or harmonics. That's an interesting idea. It's a very interesting idea. I, you know, I could probably help a lot of students I got with uh, who have it, trouble getting the muting idea down. <laughs> weird when a, a note actually <laughs> kind of comes out. Especially on the higher pitch strings, it kind of wants to ring out. phrase right so just play uh, just touching the strings and you, you don't press and now after playing this for a while try to press a little bit harder and find the sweet spot when you actually can hear a note so <laughs> a little bit you have this ugly sound and now a clear note that's the sweet spot you don't need to press harder so so you're gonna play a little bit just to get the actual note. So when you find the sweet spot and you try to keep it consistently uh, almost with the same feeling of just resting your fingers on top of the strings um, so you can do it through your phrasing modes pentatonic and you get the purest sound of a note with almost no tension so that's the idea okay so playing lightly with total control so again <laughs> spot the minimal effort to get the actual real note right That's what you have to practice. It's simple, 
so we can practice in any of your phrases or scales. I believe it's a very powerful exercise teaching your hands, your fingers and your brain that you don't need to <coughs> squeeze the neck to get a note. So I hope this video was helpful. Well, everybody, we, uh, we got an interesting situation here. We, we've already gone through two videos and we've been streaming for 30 minutes. So another good video. I have nothing to add to that either. Cool. We're <laughs> Let's go to another one. Um, I'm going to have to change the title of this thing once more. Uh, let's see. Live reaction response to multiple guitar instruction videos. How about that? We're going for a third. Let's find something we can uh, we can talk about. Da -da 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 -da. That's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. All right. Well, this one here we have get better at music by practicing less. That sounds interesting. However, however, yeah, why not? Let's just go to that one. All right. Before that starts, I'm going to have a quick bathroom break. Let's see. Boom. There we go. All right. Be right back. Right. Let's get back at it. Bathroom break over. Okay, so let's watch a third video of this stream called Get Better at Music by Practicing Less. Uh, let's see, we want this guy. By Brad Harrison Music. It looks like he's playing a trumpet in his, his little thumbnail avatar there um so <laughs> like this the first chapter is titled controversial statements neat all right here we go video number three of this the stream how to get better at music and stop wasting time by practicing less and how you should actually spend your time How's that for a controversial statement? I can hear you mocking me now. And it's fair to question such a statement. It almost calls to mind other famously controversial musical statements like, if you can play it slowly, you can play it quickly. Which is actually a perfectly reasonable starting point, but it does skip some steps. But for now, let's focus on the question, how can you get better with less practice? Will you just become a better musician over time with magic? Well, sadly, no. But stick with me here, because I think there are actually two ways we can improve by practicing less and the first has to do with the fact that many of us would benefit from examining what does the word practice really mean. 
What are we actually trying to achieve when we practice? And by contrasting the word practice with another word that fits better for a lot of situations, and that word is learning. Of course, musicians need to practice to improve. There's no question about that. Practice and maintenance are fundamental, and I would never suggest that you don't spend time practicing. But consider that when an experienced musician talks about preparing for a performance or a gig, they might use the word practice like, I have to go practice for my gig. But I've found that they're just as likely to say, yeah, me too, I have to go learn my music. Now, there's a subtle but crucial difference there, because to me, practice has to do with trying to get better at things you already basically know how to do. But learning is the acquisition of new knowledge or skills, or at the very least, preparing and becoming familiar with new material. I like that description. Like, um, students ask me about, like, you know, how often, they ask how often I practice, and it's pretty much non-existent at this point. The last time I had big practice sessions, well, I was live streaming those things for a great deal of the time, getting ready for that metal instruction course uh, with Troy Grady and Cracking the Code, which should be coming out soon. He did tell me he wants to have that ready for a Black Friday sale, so who knows, maybe... Hopefully that happens. But uh, anyway, because yeah, to me, practicing is trying to get better at something versus playing things that you can already do well uh, and you're just having fun. It's like, to me, there is definitely a difference between just practicing and playing to play. Could you argue that rehearsing your songs is different than practicing them? Yeah, it's fairly similar. Like when I'm playing my material, if I'm doing so to prepare for a show, yeah, that's like practice. But, you know, making sure that I identify things that I'm sucking at and trying to get better at. So, and then, yeah, learning things. There's, there's certainly, they go hand in hand, practicing and learning, right? Because like when I give my students stuff, it's to learn new material. But then you get that new material and then you practice it to get better at it. So, so far, we got another really great video here. Let's get back to it. People sometimes treat these words as interchangeable, but consider the following. If you're a dancer, you can practice a dance routine, but you have to learn the choreography first. You can't try to make your steps and movements faster and smoother if you haven't learned what the steps and movements are yet. It just wouldn't make any sense to jump in at full speed if you don't know what to do first. Learn the steps first and then practice them. Excellent point. It's like uh, when I give students something new, and perhaps it's a, a fairly difficult thing, or at least difficult for them. I always have everyone practice to a metronome all the time. All the time. They're damn near all the time. More than 90% of the time I'm saying metronome that thing. But if they're, you know, it's a brand new thing, it's complicated with the rhythm, maybe the fingering is complicated, and like many times people will turn on the metronome and start trying to do it, and they'll fumble, you know, goof it up several times in a row. I'm like, wait, it's like, turn the metronome off first, get familiar with what it is you're trying to play, and then put it to the metronome. So, yeah, if you don't know or you're very unfamiliar with the new thing, you're, you're not doing yourself any favors trying to play it up to speed right away. Give yourself a moment to actually learn, get familiar with what it is. If you're a cook, you can practice making a recipe but only if you're already basically familiar with all the vocabulary and techniques. If you're making chicken pot pie from scratch, you've got to know what mirepoix is, and you can't ruin was it if you have no idea what that is. And you've got to know how to make bechamel and pastry, which are recipes unto themselves. So you can't really practice the recipe until you've learned all the things the recipe is asking you to do. If you're an actor, you can practice your lines, but only if you know how to pronounce the words in the script. And if you're playing a doctor on a starship speaking to a space wizard, your lines might be absolutely filled with terms and names that are long and unfamiliar and difficult to read at first. You'll have to spend time working on how to make those unfamiliar sounds into familiar sounds that you can pronounce with ease. Only then can you really practice your lines and craft your performance. 
And if you're a musician and you're working on a piece of music, you first need to understand what the piece is asking of you. That means you need to know how to physically play all the notes on your instrument, how to read and interpret the rhythms, and what all the other terms and symbols mean too. Novice and intermediate musicians routinely encounter new notes, rhythms, or other musical elements that they have to learn how to execute. Mo <laughs> Looking at this, I can tell what it is. Like, you know, you got your half note there, you got your two quarter notes, you got a dotted eighth note, followed by two sixteens, then a quarter note, and then all this, six notes a click there. So you got your sex tuplets. Two sixteenth notes, sixteenth note rest, another sixteen, another sixteenth note rest. Why? <laughs> Not what is this rhythm? Why is this rhythm? Um, you know, five notes a click, that's an odd one to try and figure out there. We're not really figure out, feel out. I think it's very rare you actually have five note groupings in a beat. Squiggly lines, trill, at least that's my understanding of it, trill. But isn't there usually a note that you're supposed to trill to, not just that? Maybe this is something different for a different instrument, I don't know. I I can't remember what this the yes, the eye of Sauron means. I know that's a whole note, but I do not remember what that thing is. It's something you really don't see in guitar playing music now, is it? At least I don't come across it often enough to remember what it is. Anyone in the chat remember what it is? You know what it is? I can't remember. Oh, this down here. Now that this is my a lot of the stuff I work on with students there. But I'm just looking at that. It's a fairly straightforward rhythm. Like one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a. You know, this one is definitely not so straightforward because that would be coming in on the one here. You'd have your one E and a two, two E. Although. Dotted quarter note. God, why did I say dotted eighth note? No wonder that screwed me up. That is a dotted quarter note, dotted, dotted eighth note. That's why it did not mathematically add up. Duh. Because that would be coming out on the one, and then this would be on the and uh, so you have your one and a three. Da 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 da. -da. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Let's keep watching. Most new pieces will have something new they haven't seen before. But even if you do understand everything, there may be sections that are awkward or unfamiliar or just really dense with musical information. You might find yourself struggling to even play the correct notes because there's just so many of them, and it can be a bit overwhelming. You have to get familiar enough with the notes that you're not making a bunch of errors before you even worry too much about speed or even expression. You have to learn the piece before you can practice it. Practice is the act of polishing and refining, reinforcing. Nick Belcher says, I think the eye of Sauron means you stop counting. Just let the tempo fall away. Oh, could be wrong. Been a while since they Oh, that's interesting. I think usually, yeah, if I see something like that, they just put free time or free tempo, something like that. I guess with the stuff that I do anyway, you know, following drums and click tracks and all that stuff, we don't really, we usually don't <laughs> let the tempo just fall away like that. But I suppose with the solo piece, that could work just fine, but not in a band situation, usually. But, thank you. Look at that. We are learning things today. Gotcha. Perhaps what the guy was putting up on screen was, uh, like, just almost like two pieces of music, just to have different examples up there. Practice is the act of polishing and refining. Forcing good habits. Reinforcing. And maintaining skills and abilities of things you can already do. Let's go back to the maintaining start of that sentence. Maintaining skills before you even worry too much about speed or even expression. You have to learn the piece before you can practice it. Yes. Practice is the act of polishing and refining. Reinforcing good habits and maintaining skills and abilities of things you can already do. Hmm. Learning is the process of acquiring skills, knowledge, and understanding in the first place. Practice is walking down a path, wearing it in, and moving along it faster and smoother. Learning is creating the pathways in the first place. And if you try to run really fast while creating a new path, you might just run into a tree. <laughs> now you might be saying, yeah, 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 learning, practicing, whatever. 
What's the difference? The goal is the same. Sound good and play well. So who cares about what you call the process? But I think there's a real danger to conflating the two terms, because it seems that some musicians kind of skip the learning phase and move straight to the practice phase, and they end up wasting a ton of time. They'll play a piece or passage over and over again, at full tempo or close to it, making the same or different mistakes each time, with no particular tactic for how to improve accuracy, seemingly just hoping that it will magically get better. And they might... Hoping it magically gets better. See, I get a feeling he's about to say something at least similar to what I teach people, and that's only perfect practice makes perfect. Because if you just throw yourself at something, hoping that it'll your mistakes will suddenly go away and it'll all of a sudden just click, as many instructors out there tell people, um, like I can't think of uh, no, I actually can't think of one guy. I don't know his name, but it just like teaching people or telling people that you know all these things will just magically click. And you'll suddenly just be able to play things. That's not true. Because if you're practicing something full of mistakes for years, well, all you've done is practice mistakes. You just continue to rehearse those mistakes. There might be different mistakes that keep happening. But if you don't focus on making sure you're playing all the notes correctly and making it sound right, you're not going to get anywhere. So yeah, perfect practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect is a load of baloney. It's absolute garbage. Only perfect practice makes perfect. I want to take a closer look at these the attempts things that he's saying here, but uh, I'm really liking how this one's going. Let's I'm gonna rewind it a little bit. Skip the learning phase and move straight to the practice phase, and they end up wasting a ton of time. They'll play a piece or passage over and over again at full tempo or close to it, making the same or different mistakes each time with no particular tactic for how to improve accuracy, seemingly just hoping that it will magically get better. And they might play it 20 times in a row and then somehow play it correctly, mostly by accident, and exclaim, I did it! But did they really? The thing that comes to mind when this happens is video games. Now, I'm not anti-gaming at all. Let's take a look at those. Oh, it's too far with no particular tactic for how to improve accuracy, seemingly just hoping that it will magically get... Yeah, played the first bar and then got lost. <clears throat> so what happens if you play the first bar and get lost? Well, played the first bar and got lost again. So if you got lost when you got to the second bar, what my recommendation would be is you focus on what that second bar is. So I always tell students, focus on the trouble spot. So let's say you did play the first bar, like it says here. You played the first bar fine, and then you got lost. Well, focus on where you keep getting lost. So if you're getting lost in the second bar there, just focus on that second bar. Play the two bars and then realize the Bs aren't flat. Well, play the first two bars and realize you're still playing B flat. Played the first seven notes, then stopped for no reason. Realize you've been ignoring the eighth notes, playing all sixteens. That's something I'll have students do every now and then. They'll like almost forget that they were even like playing a, a eighth note or a quarter note, and then they start picking a bunch of more bunch more notes. It has recently happened with somebody. He was supposed to play a quarter note at the end of a phrase. And all of a sudden, he just starts doing constant eighth notes. So like I asked, like, do you realize that you're not playing quarter notes anymore? And he had no idea. So, it's interesting how people don't realize those things. And why it's important for some people to actually have a teacher or guitar coach. Because sometimes having a more coach-like approach for, like, speed building or whatnot can be helpful. Just like gym type stuff. Sometimes you need an outside opinion or view in order to guide you to where you're trying to go. Because sometimes we can get our get in our own way. Um, anyway, with some other things here. Attempt number seven. The high note is an A, not a C. Attempt number eight. Realize you're still playing B. Well, 
This must be common for his instrument of playing B flats and not a B natural. Anyway, let's continue on. It better. And they might play it 20 times in a row and then somehow play it correctly, mostly by accident, and exclaim, I did it! But did they really? The thing that comes to mind when this happens is video games. Now, I'm not anti-gaming at all. I've owned many gaming systems and continue to spend many hours gaming. I adore a tower defense game. The first Plants vs. Zombies was a hilariously themed masterpiece. But the thing about games is, you only need to beat a level in a game once in order to move on. You can fail 19 times in a row, succeed once, and finally move on to the next level. Or maybe beat the whole game in glorious and deeply satisfying triumph. But some skills are different. In music, if you just played a passage wrong 19 times in a row and finally play it right once, you've still got a 95% failure rate behind you. So what are the chances that you're going to play it right the next time? I would say, not great. And you have to be really careful because the saying, practice makes perfect, really isn't correct. Aha! Look at that. We agree that practice makes perfect is not correct. If you practice a mistake, you can learn it really, really well. Have you ever... Practice a mistake and you can learn the mistake really well. Look at that. See? I'm not the only one who preaches this. Good. Learned someone's name wrong. You probably hesitated when using their name. Mark is in the chat. Name for weeks afterwards. Learning something wrong can haunt you. If you practice the wrong notes or rhythms, you might very well learn them. So be careful, because practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. I like that too. Practice makes permanent. So if you continue practicing mistakes, those mistakes will be made permanent. And you never... You're right. So only perfect practice makes perfect. And then imperfect practice makes, makes you sound like shite. If you're choosing between practicing for accuracy and practicing for speed, choose accuracy over speed always. Yes! Accuracy first! And, and you guys know I'm all about speed. But yeah, far too often I have I've had students that focus on reaching a number, reaching a number, and it sounds terrible. And it's just a sloppy, f absolute garbage mess. Stop it. Stop chasing the speed. Focus on your accuracy first. Speed is a byproduct of playing accurately at slightly faster tempos over time. Accuracy first. Because over time, your performance will almost always get faster and smoother all on its own. There we go. Well, not necessarily all on its own. I mean, it depends on how fast you're trying to go. Eventually, if you're want to get really crazy fast you will have to push your speed so you do have to push your speed at some point but you still focus on being accurate before you increase that speed accuracy first speed second but if you practice while only caring about speed will accuracy increase maybe no. who knows only perfect practice makes perfect aha he said the thing i say good well we this is the first time we've well this is the first time we have been watching three videos in a live stream. But Yeah. So far I mean I, I think I'm gonna agree with everything in this video here. The first video we watched. All good stuff. Nothing to really add. Second video, another good chunk of information to try out. And here we go. Third video. With fantastic information. I like it. If you play a piece even extremely slowly but accurately, all your teacher can really say to you is, that was great, practice it a bunch and make it faster. But if you play it fast and it's just, you know, a mess, where can you even begin other than fixing the errors? <laughs> Imagine a restaurant that advertises super fast service and you order a burger and fries. And the server returns a few seconds later and excitedly presents you with a live cow and a raw potato. You'd say, what is this? And they'd say, your dinner. And you say, uh, this isn't what I ordered? And the server would say, sure it is. And you'd say, uh, okay, it isn't ready yet. And the server would say, maybe, but wasn't it fast? So question in the comments here. Uh, Nick asked, how would you recommend improving accuracy? Just slow, perfect reps? Like, yeah, exactly. Just got to start slow enough so you can play it correct. And if it's not correct, well, 
I mean, it, depending on what it is, you know, will determine what you got to change. So it could be the notes need to sound better. Like maybe you, you're hitting the wrong notes. Could be that you're not fretting things properly. Could be you're not placing the notes where they belong in the rhythm. But yeah, if you can't play it slow correctly, good, you're not going to be playing it fast correctly. There's another reason why I'm all about metronome work. If you can't play it correct at 60, you're not, then you're not ready for 65. If you can't play it correctly at 65, don't go on to 70 and so on. So, yeah. Just make it sound correct at the slower speed and then try it for the faster. So, the moral of the story for part one of how to get better by practicing less is learn first, then practice. Don't skip the learning step and jump straight to practicing, because you can't really practice something until you've learned it. Even though some people try, they're mostly just wasting time and maybe even getting worse. Whether you're looking at a small project or a large project, remember that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. For music, start by learning the notes and rhythms very carefully and accurately. Then learn what all the other stuff on the page means and start to work that in. And then you can practice and polish and make it good. The process doesn't really change if the piece is short or long, but whatever you do, don't practice mistakes because you might just learn them. Now that we've established the importance of learning versus practice, let's look at the second way to get better at music by practicing less, which is to make time to learn new things. If you're brand new to music, everything is new and you're constantly in the learning phase. You're learning notation, sound production, technique, repertoire, and all kinds of vocabulary, symbols, and concepts. There's a lot to learn, but your songs and exercises are probably pretty short and simple, covering one or two things at a time, and you mostly just play each one a couple of times and move on to the next thing you need to learn. But after you've learned a few things and you've got a few tunes and exercises under your belt, it feels really good to play them, and you probably have some favorites. Music is so fun and satisfying because there is a unique joy of execution. It feels so good to nail a passage and feel your body and instrument vibrating and making amazing, beautiful, awesome sounds, and everyone likes to do things that they're good at because it makes us feel good. So we often practice the same songs and scales and exercises, polishing and refining over and over and over. And <laughs> while of course music requires maintenance and repetition, we have to be careful that we don't practice old things so much that we forget to work on new things. Because if you only ever do the same things, you never really grow or improve. <laughs> Think of some other disciplines. Learning a language requires new phrases and vocabulary, not just practicing the same few phrases over and over. Chefs and cooks learn by challenging themselves with new ingredients, new techniques, and new recipes, rather than just cooking the same few dishes over and over. If you're working on fitness, you need to push yourself to go further, harder, faster. Yep. Weightlifters know that you won't get any stronger if you just keep lifting the same weight over and over forever. That's right. You have to increase the weight to get stronger. Yep. And runners and cyclists know that you have to increase your speed, distance, and resistance if you want to improve your performance. And even if you are already quite fit, it's always good to learn new exercises and movements. Try yoga or rock climbing or parkour. It's good for your brain and your body to work different muscles in different ways. Now, if you just play for fun now and then, you know a few tunes and you're happy with that, that's awesome. I'm not gonna tell you you're doing music wrong. Music is the best, maybe we can play together sometime. But if you do want to improve, you should really think about challenging yourself with new scales, new pieces, new exercises, and new repertoire. Not only will new challenges make you a better musician and actually help you play old repertoire even better, I really believe that humans require growth. We don't do well with stagnation. Agreed. Comfort is comfortable and we love the familiar, but if you only play the same songs over and over again without any novelty, growth, or improvement, you won't grow or improve either. That's right. You'll either get bored and quit, or when you are confronted with a new challenge, you won't know how to approach it because you only know how to do what you already know how to do. But if you do make a habit of learning new things and you learn how to learn, you'll realize that every new challenge is just a puzzle to be unlocked and understood, or a journey to begin. And as gloriously satisfying as achieving a particular goal can be, that satisfaction will fade. Happiness is derived from growth. Practice and maintenance is fundamental, but always remember to grow. So that's the second way you can get better by practicing less. Don't just practice the same things that you already know how to do over and over forever. Be sure to make time to learn and grow with new and challenging exercises, songs, and projects. Finally, let's take a look at how you might want to structure your time between learning and practice to improve and grow in both the short and long term. 
And quick side note, although we just made a great big deal about the difference between practice and learning, when you spend time alone on your instrument working on music, virtually everyone calls it practice or a practice session. And calling it a learning session is only going to annoy people. So feel free to say practice, but we know what you really mean. Of course, every musician will have different needs, interests, and abilities. But here's a general outline that should be adaptable and useful for most people. Your routine should be broken up into four basic sections, warm-up, technique, projects, and review. Warm-up is all about physically preparing to play, and it involves a few different things. First, you need to prepare your space. Adjust your music stand, make sure you have your music and a pencil, and of course, assemble and set up your instrument with any accessories you'll need. Next, prepare your body. Take a few moments to loosen up and stretch your fingers, arms, lips, lungs, feet, whatever you use to actually play your instrument. Try to release tension and get into good posture. Then, prepare to play. Make some sounds, tune up, and make sure you're feeling good and sounding good. Different musicians will have different needs in this regard. Some will be ready in just a few minutes, and some... So, as far as like warming up for a guitar, I mean, I, same approach I do in the gym. Like if I'm gonna warm up, like today, first thing I started off was like tricep press down with the cable. How did I warm up for that? I used about half the weight for my working set and did high reps with that and then increased the weight a little bit, did a little bit less reps, increased the weight again, even fewer reps, and then I was ready to hit the heavy set. So same idea here, like in everyone who follows the whole metronome approach I talk about, you are warming up while you're working on something. So the whole metronome method approach takes care of damn near everything. You're warming up as you're working on the thing you're working on. So I, like I never found it necessary to do any kind of stretches or whatnot before playing. Um, similar to like it's not recommended to stretch, do static stretching before you do any kind of weight resistance because apparently you can actually decrease your strength a little bit. Like there's the dynamic stretching that could be a bit more appropriate. But yeah, I guess, I don't know. The whole stretching before playing, I've never never done it never found it necessary because i just start moving my fingers and eventually they're they get more warmed up and just kind of gradually ease into whatever the heck it is i'm doing and metronome practice will, will take care of that for you some will take a bit longer think of warm-up like boiling a pot of water it might be fast or slow depending on a few factors but it really doesn't matter if you're an expert chef or brand new to cooking the water isn't boiling until it's boiling and you really can't rush it or skip that step. If you do try to play when you're not warm, you probably won't sound very good. Everything will be a bit more difficult, and you might as well try to make spaghetti with cold water. Moving on, warm-up blends very well into the next section, which is all about technique. This is where you maintain and enhance mechanical things like scales, patterns, and other instrument-specific dexterity challenges. All the things that make you a better musician by gaining a better command of your instrument. Review old scales to make sure they're still solid and maybe make them faster and cleaner, and spend time working on new scales to build your key fluency. You might even want to work on accents, dynamics, articulation, or expanding your upper and lower register. Every instrument and musician will have different needs here, but this section is a bit like running laps or doing push-ups or eating your vegetables. It may not always be super exciting, but working on technique on a regular basis will make every other thing you do easier. Next is projects. This is the main course of your practice session. This section is all about preparing repertoire and making progress on specific pieces or songs. And it can be challenging work. Practice is kind of easy because it's familiar material that you're trying to make even better. But this can be much more effortful because by definition, you're doing things that you're not very good at yet. Things that you either haven't learned or are in the process of learning. So allow yourself to struggle a bit and maybe sound like you don't know what you're doing because you don't yet. Of course, that doesn't mean to sound bad or practice mistakes, but try not to worry about what the person outside the practice room thinks of you. With a new piece or difficult section, you may be playing very slowly and awkwardly and with very little flow, and that's just fine. Don't just play fast and hope it gets better. Practice deliberately and work it out. If you work hard with attention to detail and general mindfulness, you'll get better and faster and smoother. You may have a few different projects on the go at different levels of readiness. The first two sections are mostly routine, but this section is dynamic and how you approach each project may vary. 
Some things will be in the very early stages of learning, while others might be further along, and you'll just be working on speed or expression. Remember that this section is about progress. Just pick something that isn't performance ready and make it better than it was. The final section, review, is kind of like dessert. Maintain and revisit repertoire and play things that you're great at and that you really love. You've put hard work into this practice session. This is the payoff. And after all that hard work on stuff that you're not very good at, it's always a good idea to remind yourself of the things that you are good at. Music is fantastic and it can be so much fun and it's important to remember that, especially when you've just finished working on a bunch of new and difficult things. So that's how you can get better by practicing less. Number one, learn first, then practice. Otherwise, you might just be wasting a ton of time learning things wrong. And number two, make time to learn new things, to grow and challenge yourself rather than just practicing the same stuff over and over. And when you do sit down with your instrument, balance your time between a proper warm-up so you sound good, techniques so you can get around your instrument better, projects to improve specific pieces, and review to maintain repertoire and have some fun. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications, and check the description for links to more videos and my Patreon page. Thanks for watching. Fantastic. Wait, what? In university, my ear training class was struggling with identifying certain chords, and after a couple of weeks, the professor, Mark Salman, fantastic professor, Mark Salman asked, said, have you tried practicing? And we said, no. And he said, well, we've all, we've all tried not practicing. How's that going for you? And we said, bad. And he said, okay, maybe try practicing and see what happens. And we did, and it got better. Interesting. All right. Uh, yeah. Fantastic stuff. Well, we've been going for an hour here. Um, I think three videos is fine. We're not going to do any more today. Let me add this to the uh, description here on the old YouTube. Let's see. First time watching. Practicing less. All right. Peter, hello. Uh, let's see. Have I ever tried any licks from Rusty Cooley's Art of Picking? I, have, I don't think I have. Well, hey, how, how about we do that? Let's play a little bit here. Let me remove this from the watch later list. Oh, goodness. Rusty Cooley, Art of Picking. I know that there's a PDF, huh? Chops from hell. Okay. Let's just let's go to one. I oh, mean, starting on the 24th fret. I don't want to do this. Can I zoom in here? Yes, I can. E natural minor sequence of fives. Hey, I said earlier, you usually don't play things in groups of five, and the first Rusty Cooley thing we're looking at here is in groups of five. Fantastic. I don't know if I can get this on the screen to be read easily. It's kind of, it's a little, kind of big. What is this? So we got, holy crap. One, two, three, four, five. You can't see what I'm doing. Find the lick number. Okay, we'll let you do that while I let you find the lick number while I check out the first one here. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two. And then. A 
feeling I know where this is going. So 24, 19, 20, 15, 17, 12, 14, 8, yep. Oh, there we go. So that's the pattern. Okay. Now it's not on screen. If you look up uh, Rusty Cooley's The Art of Picking, they got PDFs of it up there. I hope I hope Rusty's okay with that. He's not upset. Like, why are people putting my shit online for free? Exercise number 16. Cool idea there. All right. Well, let me check that out in a moment here. I want to see where I can get the one I was just I just learned. Um, it's pretty simple idea it really does cover the whole fretboard there so if you don't have 24 frets you can't play it knowing the key of e minor is extremely helpful because if you don't know it well good luck navigating it really quickly five notes a click holy moly all right let's see the instruction is on youtube in full is did rusty put that out on his own channel, or does somebody like just upload it because they what well, you can nowadays? So it always starts out with like a starts like a descending back up, and then it goes down one degree in the scale, but then goes up then down. Thank <laughs> you. 
my eyes. Double the speed. Started at 60, of course, going up in fives. Woo, this is getting tricky. Here's 120. Can I at least double double what we started with? Goodness. I don't think I'm gonna get much further. It's getting uh getting harder. Rather difficult to keep it all synced up well. too much faster today. Let's take a look at the uh, Rift 16 you said. And thank you. That's how, that's how I tell everyone to build up everything. Just go up in fives. Number two, four, da, 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 da. Okay. Number 16. These are 16th notes. It says C major. Right. Good lord, dude. <laughs> it's gonna take a while just to get the pattern down. It's like there's a, he's clearly got something set to where he'll 
shift up to the next position in the strings while also shifting down strings at a certain point. What is the pattern? <laughs> Downstroke there, shouldn't it? Yeah. Calls it the lick that goes nowhere. Oh, number 16 here. Man, this thing. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one. I don't think I have the brain power to work this son of a bitch up. Like I'd need to break this down into pieces to memorize what the heck it is. <laughs> Well, I think it's about time to call it a, call it a day. Well, at least this riff is shorter. This is a short one, but still, what the heck is it doing? <laughs> Yeah, forget it. My my brain's turned to mush. And I got two short lessons I gotta make. I gotta watch a couple of video lesson submissions from two of my video correspondence students. Well, good. I'm glad the uh, approach I gave you, or the approach I told about, was helping you. Very good, very good.
was doing. Blackened Rift is pretty damn fast, especially down picking it the whole time, which is also my favorite Metallica riff, which apparently was written by Jason Newstead. Go figure. All right, time to wrap it up. As always, thank you to everyone who watched. Apologies for not having a whole lot of new information to share this week. I suppose that's uh, going to happen sometimes. I didn't pick controversial enough videos. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll be back on same time next week, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And uh, we'll see what kind of discussions we can start next time. All right. So that's that. See you next week. <laughs>